This is Miss Bufford, and in this video, we're going to talk about isotopes and isotopic composition. So your learning goals for this video are to be able to explain what isotopes are and give examples of some common isotopes, and to be able to calculate the average atomic mass of an element when you're given the isotopic composition for that element. And so atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons, and these are called isotopes. So remember before we talked about the fact that the mass of an atom is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so what this really means is that atoms of the same element can have different masses. And if you take a look at these um, three examples that I have over here, these are all three carbon isotopes. And we have carbon 12. And you notice that they all have the same number of protons. And that's what makes these carbon. They have to have the same um, they have to have six protons in order to be carbon, but they can vary in the number of neutrons that they have. And you'll notice that carbon-12 has um, six neutrons, carbon-13 has seven, and carbon-14 has eight. And if we add up the numbers of protons and neutrons, we'll get their mass numbers. So that's why we say um, carbon-12 is represents, you know, typical carbon atoms. Um, carbon-13 is the isotope that has the seven neutrons, so six plus seven is 13. And carbon-14 right here um, is carbon is the isotope that has eight neutrons, so six plus eight is 14. Right, so this is called isotope notation when we write the name followed by the mass for that isotope. All right, so I'm just gonna talk about three different elements and some of their common isotopes, just so you guys have some examples. Um, so carbon really does have 15 known isotopes, but only two of them are stable, and only three of them are naturally occurring in carbon samples. Um, so we have carbon-12 and carbon-13. Carbon-12 makes up just almost 99% of carbon atoms. Um, it's the most abundant carbon isotope. Um, and then we have carbon-13 that makes up about 1% of carbon um, in nature. And then carbon-14 is, is the really a rare form of carbon. Um, it makes up less than 0.1%, uh, less than 0 .1%, so about one in a trillion carbon atoms. And this isotope is really handy because it's radioactive. And it can be used um, in biomedical research to make sure that new drugs that are being tested um, are metabolized in the body without uh, forming harmful byproducts. So it can be used as kind of a tracer there. Um, it can be used in agriculture. Um, it's used for um, tracking and controlling pollution. And it can also be used in archaeology to date artifacts and archaeological sites that are up to about 60,000 years old. Um, iodine is the next element that we're going to talk about. Um, iodine has 37 known isotopes, but only one of those isotopes is stable. All of the other isotopes of iodine are radioactive to some degree. Um, iodine-131 is one of those very handy uh, iodine isotopes, and it is produced in nuclear reactors for the purpose of treating um, thyroid disorders such as Graves' disease and thyroid cancers. Um, and then a few other iodine isotopes that are useful in the medical industry um, are iodine-123, 125, and 129. And again, um, these are used in biomedical research, and they're also used to diagnose uh, metabolic disorders and thyroid disease. And then the last element that we're going to talk about is cobalt. Um, cobalt has 29 known isotopes, but only one stable isotope again. So Cobalt-59 is the only stable isotope, and Cobalt-60 is a very handy radioactive isotope that's used for sterilizing surgical instruments. Um, it can be used in cancer treatment. It's also used to irradiate food products, so um, sometimes you will find irradiated produce or irradiated meats at the grocery store, and this just means that those, those items have been exposed to radioactive materials in order to kill harmful bacteria and help preserve those foods longer. Um, so that's actually a good thing. And then uh, cobalt is also used in radiography, so it's used in x-ray machines and stuff like that. All right, so 
you do have to know how to calculate the atomic mass or the average atomic mass. And w when we're dealing with substances in the lab, those substances are naturally going to contain a mixture of all of the different isotopes that exist for each element in that substance. And because we know the abundance of each isotope found in nature, and we know that each different isotope has its own unique mass, we can use this information to help us calculate a weighted average. And this weighted average um, is called the atomic mass, or sometimes we refer to it as the average atomic mass for that element. And it's the number that shows up as the mass number on the periodic table. And we do this, we put this number on the periodic table because we want to account for all of the different isotopes that, that might be present in our, um, our substances. And so um, one question that I get asked often is, why is it better to calculate a weighted average um, rather than just calculating the regular average, just adding them all up and dividing by the number um, of isotopes that you have? And the, the reason is because the weighted average actually takes into account how abundant a particular isotope is. And so if you have an, an isotope that's, you know, 1% of all of the atoms versus an isotope that's 99%, if you just took a regular average, then you wouldn't really get a true value as far as, you know, what you can expect the mass of a sample to be. But if you take a weighted average, then um, most of the mass that's reported is going to be closer, or the final mass that's reported is going to be closer to the more abundant isotope. And so it's really important to take a weighted average when we're doing this. All right, so here is how we calculate the average atomic mass or the atomic mass for an element. The first thing we want to do is we want to take the percentages or the abundances um, from each isotope and we want to convert them to decimal numbers. And so if you take a look at this little chart right here, this tells you um, which isotope we have and how abundant it is. So, for example, iron 56 is 91.72% of all iron atoms. All right, so that's the most abundant one. And what we're going to do is we're going to take those percentages and we're going to move the decimal over to the left two spaces. And that converts it from a percentage into a nice number that we can use in a calculation. Because remember, we can't use percentages in a calculation. And then the next thing, oops, the next thing that we want to do is we want to multiply the mass of each isotope by its abundance. And so this is our abundance right here. And I want to take the masses for each abundance. So 2.20 right here went with the um, iron 57, iron 58, was uh, this abundance right here. So we just make sure that we got these all paired up correctly. So iron 54 was 5.80% and then iron 56 was 91.72%. All right, so we've got these all paired up correctly. And then what you wanna do is perform that calculation and then you wanna add all these values together. And before I move forward, I just want to make sure that um, you know how to, to report your significant digits for these correctly. Because these masses are just the sum of the particles in the nucleus, when they're written like this, it's just protons plus neutrons, that's an exact number. And so we don't have to look at the, the mass in this case for significant digits. We want to look at the abundance to determine our significant digits for these answers. So um, if I'm multiplying these two, I want to make sure that I have, I have um, um, three significant digits here, two here, three here, and four here. And so I've reported those all with the correct number of significant digits. And then I want to add them all up. And I end up with 55.90 atomic mass units. And that looks like what I should have gotten based on, you know, that number right there. All right. Let's do one more example. All right, so now um, I've got some information for the abundance of zinc isotopes. And it looks like zinc has five different isotopes um, listed here. And so, or five different naturally occurring isotopes. And so the first thing I want to do, again, is I want to convert the values for the percent abundance from percentages to decimals. So I'm going to write down all those percentages and I'm going to convert them to the decimal numbers I need for my calculation. 
And then the next step is to multiply the mass of each isotope by its abundance. And so I'm going to multiply those by their masses, their respective masses. And I'm going to solve those. And then I just want to add all these numbers together. And I get 65.44 atomic mass units. So uh, one good thing to have um, ready for the next test is just these steps and maybe an example calculation to help you um, have something to, to look at. Um, I hope this video was helpful. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Thank you for watching Buffered Chemistry. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more chemistry help.